in Iran and and other parts of the world, but Baha'i is really the religion of the United Nations. And that is another important thing to understand right now because we are moving into a new place that Alan talked about at the end of this poem when he said, when the guns all fall silent and they ring the old peace bell will be altered, chipped, monitored in their utopian hell. And in Bible prophecy, you have Armageddon, a place called Armageddon. And this is in the book of Revelation. It is a prophesied location of a gathering of armies. This is an end time fighting it out. You see Armageddon mentioned in Islamic theology. Hills of Megiddo, they're called a mountain or range of hills. Megiddo and Armageddon factors into dispensationalism. And, and remember, this is important because you have literally millions of Christians who have been influenced by this, that there is to be tribulation. There is to be end times tribulation. And there was a song that Alan played on one of his blurbs. It was by someone who is really called one of the fathers of Christian rock, and his name was Larry Norman. Larry Norman's Peace Pollution Revolution, um, the, also known as Keep Your Eyes on Palestine. And I played it the other day. I, I just wanted to hear it again. And this time I heard some things that I hadn't really noticed before, but right at the end, he sings the word revolution, and then he sings the words peace and pollution, and then tribulation. And earlier in the song, he said, someday it won't be easy to stop and ca catch your breath because he's tying in pollution, you know, so he gets it all in there, you know, a green and sustainable agenda. And I, I don't think he had any awareness of that, but he's protesting this. He said, it's all in revelations. It's part of the design. And if you're truly wise, you'll keep your eyes on Palestine. So I, I'd always heard those lyrics, but it really didn't jump out at me until I listened to it this week that he said, tribulation. And I thought to myself, I bet that he was raised in some kind of um, Pentecostal, some kind of what we would call evangelical religious group. And sure enough, yes, he was. So he would have seen the world through the dispensationalist eyes. And that is important. It's important to understand the history of whatever brand of religion that you are clinging to and to understand how these will be used. And I mentioned Baha'i because it springs from Iran. It is being persecuted, but it is being protected and promoted by the United Nations. And here is the briefest little history of Baha'i. From the earliest days of the Baha'i faith in the mid-1800s, Baha'is have contributed to processes of global governance. With the founding of the League of Nations, Baha'is began to establish more formal relations with international organizations. Over the past 70 years, Baha'is have supported and contributed to UN efforts in the areas of social and sustainable development, gender equality, human rights, and UN reform, among others. The Baha'i international community is also coming to play a more active part in discussions at the regional level, and to this end has established offices in places such as Brussels and Jakarta. This is a quote on their website about us, the promise of world peace. 
The human race as a distinct organic unit has passed through evolutionary stages analogous to the stages of infancy and childhood in the lives of its individual members and is now in the culminating period of its turbulent adolescence approaching its long-awaited coming of age. So remember, Alan would give us the definition of peace that is the absence of any kind of protest or revolt or revolution when it were well, as he describes it, it has become impossible. In looking through the news, I saw that um, Palestinians flee northern Gaza after Israel orders one million of them to evacuate. This is a third of the population, and so far, um, I, I think anybody who is paying attention knows that the, the population of Gaza is quite young. I think the average age is around 17. So it's a, it's, this is a devastation. And for all of the Israelis who died, this is a devastation too. It, this is peoples, most of whom have no idea of their own history. They don't. Very few Israelis today are going to understand anything about the Balfour Declaration or Hitler's transfer agreement. It, th these things won't be taught in school. They won't know about it. And so they're ignorant. And most alarming, they are ignorant of how they are being used. In the article that Alan read in this talk from 2009, he talked about Israel using Gaza as a testing ground for horrific new weapons. This came from the Irish Times. And there they were talking about phosphorus bombs. This is a fact. This happened then. What is being debated right now is that the Human Rights Watch has called out Israel once again for using phosphorus bombs. Israel has denied this. They have denied that they've used it. And phosphorus munitions are kind of tricky because it is still <clears throat> legal to use them for marking a spot, signaling, obscuring an area, but it is not to be used for uh, a weapon that can set fire to people and objects. Uh, so, and the Israelis have said that they phased this out after the 2008-2009 offensive in Gaza. So it's an ugly place that we are in. And I think I wanted to go on about this just a little bit more because when you get holy books and holy places tied into the mix, people lose their heads. There is emotion and anger and righteous indignation where perhaps there oughtn't be, where people should be taking a beat and saying, do I know everything? The propaganda right now is relentless. It's relentless. And in many ways, it's similar. It's identical to what came out in 2009. If you look, then you had, a, yeah, there was a young Palestinian college girl that seemed to be everywhere talking about what was going on in Gaza. And now there is another Palestinian college-age girl, very sympathetic, big-eyed, lovely, who is talking about the devastation. So when propaganda works, why stop it? And the things that have been said when Biden talks about babies being beheaded and then people say, well, let, let's take a beat. Do we know this? Has this been proven? It's the initial 
and and people who put out propaganda know this. It is the initial story that sticks in people's minds. So the Biden administration can step back from those comments, and then it can later be said, oh, well, we don't have proof of that, or that didn't happen, or it didn't happen in the numbers that we said it happened. It, it makes no difference because I am seeing protesters on college campuses who are holding up signs that say 50 babies beheaded. And this is how propaganda works. It sticks, it takes on a life of its own. People choose sides. And right now there is anger. And it's understandable why. As Alan made clear in this talk from 2009, the people in Gaza are in an open air prison. They are in a cage. They have been. And now they are being wiped out in huge number. And we don't really understand. We can't understand until we do an awful lot of homework and an awful lot of reading of history. Otherwise, when we're living in the now, as Alan's poem said, it really is a mystery. Here is Alan. I am Alan Watt, and this is Captain Dimitri. On the 28th of January 2009, newcomers can look into cuttingthroughthematrix.com. And on the website, you'll find lots of previous talks I've given, which you can listen to at your leisure. And I try to patch in a lot of history that's omitted from mainstream books. I even tell you of the societies that ensure that happens, since they're in control of pretty well all of mainstream media. And it certainly is better to understand the big picture, uh, however horrific it might be. And it truly does freak a lot of people out when they understand how overwhelming it seems that this big monster system is. But it's been the goal for a long time. And when you start to understand that, the panic should subside to an extent when you realize that you're living through a script, a script that involves every population on the planet. Every nation on the planet is we're guided through into like a business plan. We're, we're guided into a new world order that to some at the bottom who help champion it like the Greenies think it's going to be a wonderful utopia. But those with eyes to see at what's happening around them today with the total information network society, cameras everywhere and so on, it's going to be more of an Orwellian system, at least in this phase, as the present generation's live and then die off. They work in centuries. They plan centuries ahead. And they literally bring on wars. They have factions on all sides to guide the wars to their proper conclusions and really to affect the changes in society that war brings. They get both sides bring off in the same new path, whereas before there would be at loggerheads. Also look into Alan Watt Sentinel EU for transcripts, which you can download the transcripts of these talks, and you can print them up. They're written in the various languages of Europe. I don't ask for money from the shows that I go on, and I'm asked on an awful lot of shows, and I don't accept them all. Depends what their format is. But uh, I depend upon the listener to help support me and buy what I have for sale on my website at cuttingthroughmatrix.com. That keeps me going, and believe you me, there's no big income comes in here. If I wanted it to be so, I would bring on lots of advertisers, and I'd bring on subscriptions and so on. And that's what all the other ones do to survive. The ads you hear on this show help to go and pay for the program that helps the staff go, helps their paychecks, helps them buy the equipment and maintain the equipment, which is not cheap these days. And that's where the advertising money goes it's from the ads that you hear on the show. So if you want to support me and get the information that I'm given out to you, you know where to, where to get it or how to do it. Just go to cuttingthematrix.com website and you'll find out how to do it there. You can also donate as well. And so much for my shameless self-promotion. I won't overdo it. It's a pity I have to do it at all, but that's what happens in the society for everything supposedly is for free. I've been going on about how societies, mainly 
one big society that has circles specializing in different areas of economics and all that comes from economics, including societies, industry, material wealth of the world, and so on, how they came into being. And that was part, supposedly, of their agenda, starting with the Cecil Rhodes Foundation, which really was a continuation of a society that was already on the go in Britain. And I'd like to go into how they've affected the world today, especially some of the things that are still happening today, and how they set up the conflicts for future wars back after this break. I've gone over quite a few topics in the last few weeks to do with how systems are set up, how the culture is set up in different countries, and how commerce dominated the culture in America, and how it was manipulated to do so by people like Bernays and others who came on the scene, uh, people who were supposedly outstanding at their time, and certainly were, because he started at the age of 24, helping at the League of Nations set up uh, different organizations of propaganda that be eventually called public relations. It sounds better than straight propaganda. It's still propaganda nonetheless. And he was a past master, well-trained in the techniques from previous centuries. But all of these people, when you put them together and you find the links between them, all goes back to this group in London, England, that was setting up a world stage, a world society. They had the world citizenship ideals, and they mentioned them frequently right down through the ages, and they still do today. In fact, Mr. Rockefeller gives out the world citizenship awards. They use round table societies to debate problems that they come out of the big meetings, the world meetings of the Royal Institute for International Affairs and the CFR, and the round tables hammer out ways to implement those policies into society through, again, persuasion, propaganda, schools, every means at disposal. And they are so well funded by the big institutions, big foundations, which were set up by the banking fraternities that work in league with this group called the Royal Institute for International Affairs, CFR. The foundations supposedly, according to Quigley, were first set up uh, when the inheritance taxes came in and death duty taxes and so on came in and the big families found ways around them. So they set up the foundations which became the nucleus of keeping the aristocracy going, a parallel government that ran alongside democracy that was unimpeded by public debate or argument and they could get their agendas done without any hassle, make, make the mandate and carry it forward and get it done. Very, very simple. But they also had categorized the world because they'd used previous members before them that their studies that they'd done on the populations of the world, they were into eugenics. We must never forget this. Uh, they were using the foundations of Darwinism to explain their theory of the world and to explain the different temperaments in different cultures and society. They were the ones who categorized the Arab populations in amongst what they called the Mediterranean group. They didn't like the Mediterranean group too much. And you find that in H.G. Wells, another member, uh, he wrote about it. He categorized them in the outline of history, his own books, the different cultures and subcultures. He wasn't too fond of them. And this particular group were the ones who set up the League of Nations. They set up the Treaty of Versailles, they ran the Treaty of Versailles, they ran the negotiations, they've always drafted up the policies for Britain and the United States together and through their contact, I mean contact in the US at that time they ran President Wilson through Mandel House, Colonel Mandel House and it was, it was the United States who supplied the money and the financing to set up the League of Nations which turned into the United Nations well, what's that got to do with today? Uh, uh, very few people, hopefully, might ask. Very few. Because history is very important. And all the problems we have today were foreseen by them 100 years ago because they set up the future. And they did big plans for the Middle East 
very big plans. They withdrew so many troops from the front lines in Europe in World War I and suddenly brought them over to Palestine and Egypt because they planned to bring another group in that they would use, they would use basically as something that would, that would keep the Arab world on its tiptoes for the next hundred years. And that was the state of Israel. Professor Carl Quigley, who was the historian for this group, talks about it in page 171, actually before that as well. And it categorized the, the personality types of the Arabs. They, they lumped everybody in together. Now remember, their whole idea was first to get the English-speaking countries together as a whole, a block, as a nucleus for a world federation. And that included the United States of America. The next part was to get a united Europe through war, through conflict, and then peace resolution. They would get, hopefully, if they, their, one, their um, long aspired dream of a united Europe. But they also had plans for uniting Africa. That's still going underway today. Uh, as a uni- unify, they try and unify Arab, uh, Africa into one country. Remember what Karl Marx said? That at first you must have wars of national liberation. I mean, when you think you're free, then you must have centralized government. That's a key to it, centralization of government. The same thing happened in the U.S. with the Civil War. It's about centralization of government. So much so that Karl Marx telegraphed Lincoln, and that's on display in the records, and said he'd done the greatest thing by centralizing government. They also wanted to get a federated Arab League as well together, and all these different leagues would eventually be absorbed into one world governmental system. And that's always been their goals and aspirations. It still is. But remember, <coughs> they've always been behind the wars. To get the wars going, the conflict must be begin. And tonight, uh, on my website, I'll put up a link to a YouTube video on Brzezinski. It's a hard one to say, Brzezinski, Brzezinski. And this man, like most of these members of the trilateral group, which is one part of the CFR and the CFR he belongs to, you'll see him uh, 30 years ago uh, helping to stir up the jihad with the very people that are bombing today. And you'll even hear him saying, hear of all people saying, that God would be with them, God would be on their side. The people don't realize the CIA set up was now called Al-Qaeda, which really was just a code name for all different factions to come into and communicate through basically a radio system. And they used them, and they, used, they even gave them special writings on their holy book, the Quran, to show them why they should be in a holy war. They dreamed up into a holy war. And right through the whole war that they had with Afghanistan, in the Soviet Union and so on, uh, the U.S. and Britain were pushing the Arabs to form into these warrior groups. And supposedly, this is the outcome of them today, where we have one of them gone rogue, supposedly. And that's why we all, we all must start wearing chains of surveillance, supposedly, to keep us all safe. So you'll, see, you'll hear Brzezinski give the speech himself to the young men that he wanted to go off and fight. He also also put a link up to Mr. Rockefeller, who never retires. It's incredible. He's all over the globe with details. And you, you'll see him going going to and talking to the, the, the Council of Foreign Relations and other institutions, which they, all, they own. They all own. They own all of the, the groups that are amalgamating the Americas. He funds every single group, and that's, that's on this video as well. So you can, you can watch that. It's astonishing. But it all falls exactly in line with Carol Quigley's book, Tragedy and Hope, and the other one, The Anglo-American Establishment. It's following it to the letter. And a federated Latin America joins with a federated North America 
a member of Federation of the Americas. Then we are to join with the Federation of Europe. And then well, that will also eventually bring in more and more countries.